So this is the uh, Mission 3 commentary for T2X. And uh, right at the start here, this is after Zaya has completed the museum mission, and this is one year about, approximately, um, after Zaya has first arrived at the city and has witnessed what she believes is the death of her cousin. And so we got a lot of questions, actually, after we released about uh, the consistency of the timeline and what was going on uh, immediately outside of, uh, of Zaya's immediate perception. And so pretty much what we wanted to communicate with uh, Mission 2 and this mission here was that uh, the smugglers were, were active during this whole time. Um, they took Zaya's ship and Zaya's cargo after Mission 1 and uh, had subsequently either held on to it to, for a while, as we, as we might learn later in, in uh, the redistribution game, uh, or had sold it to, uh, to Limes, the museum curator, in Mission 2, and then he eventually put it out on display. And even though it's a year later, and uh, a lot has transpired in that time, um, it all internally makes sense. Um, because there's a lot of things that have to happen before uh, before that dragon statue is put on display. Um, Neeson, the, the leader of the smugglers, may have held on to it for a while, um, and Le Limes, uh, the curator, may have held on to it for a while before he had it repaired and put it out there. So um, that was just to address some of, the, uh, some of the plot issues that came up. We were thinking about all this, and uh, we wanted to make sure that the universe was fictionally consistent as we were going into this uh, open-ended city map here. i got to say something about the smuggler in that last picture that it showed. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the guys that did uh, a lot of the artwork for this particular briefing and then uh, some later on uh, was a friend of mine named Randall who, again, another guy who really has never played Thief, doesn't know anything about the Thief universe, but that smuggler in that picture, I mm. swear, it is a self-portrait. It looks just like the guy, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it's just funny to me when I, I'd, I'd forgotten that he had done that, but he's got kind of a cameo there in the, in the briefing, mm -hmm. uh, but that, that guy did a lot of the artwork for the briefing quite a bit of the artwork for some of the briefings. Yeah, I did quite a few. This, uh, the rest of the drawings in here, I think, were actually done by Broken Arts, who uh, also mm -hmm. did a bunch of briefing artwork for us. And yes. uh, this, this ended up being one of our more ambitious briefings. Mm -hmm. So we have like six or seven drawings here, and uh, we had to pare back uh, at the end and, and uh, reduce some of the, our, uh, the scope of some of our briefings. But this one remained intact, which is uh, fortunate. Right. Yeah, we did have to cut a lot of artwork just for time purposes. We were running out of time to release, and there's so much artwork. I mean, it was uh, amazing how much, uh, how much material was was done just in the amount of time that we had but i was happy with them i mean they're not uh obviously uh rust monkey is uh kind of known for the thief is that the name am i got i got the name right rust monkey that did, did the uh you're uh, looking at me uh, okay, i have no for, idea <laughs> for the original uh, for, games uh, uh, for the original uh, games no that yeah. are yeah rust monkey was the company formed by dan thron right. and the original uh, right. cutscene guys who did um, yeah. The cutscenes for the Thief games, yeah. and uh, by the time Thief Three came around, they had their own company. Yeah, and we all um, we definitely tried to emulate that, though. Uh, so, so here we have. Uh, you were looking back over her shoulder there at a place you walked through in Mission One, so there's a little connectivity there. Yeah, it was important for us to maintain kind of a, a real internal consistency between the missions. So wherever possible, we uh, exported and imported different pieces of maps uh, as overlook sites into other places, and that way the the world would feel uh, connected and uh, and consistent. So, <clears throat> so in this case, there's a part of Mad God's uh, Mission One that you start out overlooking um, at the start here. Um, some maps that didn't work as well, uh, like uh, for Mission 2, the uh, the museum mission that took place in Aldale, like a wealthy section of the city, uh, didn't really fit anywhere else. Um, but most of the maps, I think, uh, are appear in more than one spot in some form or another. Ice arrows. The Ice elemental arrows. catalyst. Yeah, so we, we had a really uh, uh, difficult problem uh, determining what kind of inventory items we wanted the player to have um, because there's a really hardcore contingent in the community that, uh, that doesn't want Thief gameplay changed or broken in any way, but at the same time, we didn't want to present the same old tired thing. We wanted to present new inventory items and weapons and, and give the player new opportunities for emergent gameplay. So uh, we had a lot of discussions at the start, and I, and I think somebody, it might have been Doom, came up with the idea for for ice arrows, right. which is the very first weapon that we designed, and, and we basically just wanted a weapon that would freeze AI and, and allow for a lot of different uh, possibilities there, because mm -hmm. that gives you the opportunity to run away or to use another weapon to shatter them, or you know, just to uh, to create a good escape for yourself. Um, but then the question was, how do we integrate? Like even that one single arrow, that one single weapon, do we put it in addition to all of our other arrows? Do we replace one? Um, do we change the functionality of some of our existing arrows, like the water arrow, to an inventory item? Um, how do we swap that around? And uh, eventually what we settled on was the idea of this, uh, this power-up, this elemental catalyst that would 
uh, change your arrows basically give them like new and enhanced properties and so water arrows became ice arrows and then later we had fire arrows becoming flare arrows and and uh, so on and uh, that's not necessarily the kind of idea that would work in an original game if we'd been building a game from scratch because it adds an additional layer of complexity on top of an already big inventory system but in our specific case we were developing an expansion pack and one where we could pretty much assumed that people had at least some degree of familiarity with, with Thief weapons and, uh, and Thief gameplay. And so what, what it allowed us to do was basically um, retain all the original Thief gameplay without changing it, but at the same time add this new layer on top of it and add all, and add all these other emergent possibilities on top of it. So we had four new arrows that we could integrate seamlessly with this one simple press of a button from, through this uh, inventory object, and it seemed to work pretty well. Hmm. I'm seeing as you're. This is Dave's playthrough that we're watching here, and I'm just learning. Oh, I had, had no idea that water arrow was in that corner. I just, <laughs> and I beta tested this thing a million times, but uh, it's just in 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 uh, just the different way that you know you're taking a different route and doing a little different than. Yeah, this uh, is pretty open ended. We uh, so, I do like this way into the city. I thought this was a, a great idea. Yeah, for I Sarah's here originally. Uh, this was the first place where you got an opportunity to use ice arrows, but that that was no good at all because uh, people, you know, didn't figure it out. They didn't realize that they had it on their inventory. We needed to put a, a spot at the beginning of the map, um, right right there immediately, to allow the player to to use this new tool and figure out how it worked. And so we built, uh, or or I built like a little section where there was an obvious power up that you wanted a gas arrow, which is pretty much the most yeah. uh, powerful <laughs> arrow in the game. You can always lure somebody with yeah. a gas arrow, you know. And uh, so the player is definitely going to want that, and they're going to have to figure out a way to get it. And the only way to get it is to use an ice arrow. Now, a lot of times in games, um, when you want a player to, to learn to use a new tool, obviously you're going to have a very heavy-handed tutorial where you're going to force the player to use it. Um, we really considered doing that, um, but in the end we chose not to. Thief, Thief is really... Um, doesn't do that very often. It doesn't actually force you to use any tools, um, and uh, there's there's really no precedent for it in anywhere in the Thief games. There's we don't have any systems for an infinite responding arrows if players waste all their arrows. Um, and, and we just felt, you know, the in the spirit of Thief, we didn't want to be really too heavy-handed. We just wanted to present players with an obvious opportunity to use a tool that we had just given them. And I think most players will will definitely feel inclined to do that because it's right there in front of them. You know, something else I noticed the other day when I was uh, looking back through some of this is uh, I don't know if you're gonna you, you didn't go up there, but the quote the quote scroll, mm -hmm. uh, the elusive quote scroll or one of them is up there on that rooftop, and um, all the quotes are about porn for some reason. <laughs> I, can't be, I, I was looking back through that, going, you know, I, I don't know what was going on with us at the time, but it's like we just that was like the going joke, you know, was uh -huh. uh, uh, overriding the thief files with uh, porn and stuff, and which never happened. You can blame Avalon. For that. Uh, yeah, I think mostly that was Avalon. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it was yeah. because we work like so many late nights, and yeah. it was just like late at night and in an IRC room, like full of right. a bunch of dudes. Well, and what you're, else are you going to talk about? Right. Your and your level of humor kind of goes from yeah, it goes it, right it, straight it, to the toilet. Right. It's just it, it's. It, uh, so anyway, I didn't want to reveal too many of the secrets on on my playthrough here, um, right. but but the quote scroll scroll, uh, scroll was right up there oh, in the well, area see, of I the water. It, I gave it away. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. We can tell them where it is. Yeah. I should mention actually about my playthroughs here that I intentionally played them um, a little imperfectly, and and the reason for that is just so that we can see um, the different AI behaviors and the different uh, player tools, and and ultimately I think that leads to a more entertaining. Uh, a more entertaining video to watch than than something that's completely perfect and ghosted. A video walkthrough. Yeah, a video walkthrough, <laughs> basically. So, um, but but this is an interesting scenario here. We we um, talked about different ways to get into the uh, market district. We we really wanted a a section that was kind of open for exploration at the start, like a residential area, and then the market district, which was the player's ultimate goal. And uh, we wanted a really big obvious way here, which was like a gate uh, into the city section with a puzzle to get through it. And then some less obvious ways. There's uh, the way that I went originally where you use an ice arrow to get up on a ledge and then go via rooftop. And then if you're um, willing to backtrack a little bit, uh, you can get a sewer key and then go back uh, near the beginning of the mission or to one of these places here and go through the sewers. And all those are equally valid. Yeah. So uh, this right here basically is a long conversation um, written by me, and you can tell because it's too long, that's why. <laughs> um, so, and, and it plays out right here where you witness these guards put in a gate code and then uh, open the gate, and it's kind of a two-part puzzle. You, you have to shoot an, arrow with, uh, shoot an arrow at a lever and then uh, enter the code, and if you're paying attention and you watch, then you can actually see the code and then enter it in when these guards uh, go on their break right here. And then um, You can actually see the code by using your mechanical eye to, to zoom in. Have. Yeah. <laughs> on, the, uh, on the thing that was a, that was something that was a, an issue a little bit but 
Yeah, we, we thought, uh, you know, the mechanical eye thing, we, we kept the player zoom in the game. Uh, we basically felt that, you know, any first person game pretty much that came out at the time had a zoom feature. We didn't think there was anything supernatural about it. We just yeah. left it in. It's her spyglass. So, it's a yeah. spyglass that she pulls out and uses when she. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's a little bit of trivia. The gate code here is my birthday. Oh, hey. <laughs> so, I didn't know that. <laughs> if you happen to forget, there you go. All right. And, but again, you know, with this and, uh, you know, uh, Rain designed this, this level pretty much all by himself. And, and uh, we were really going again, wanting to, to emphasize uh, the openness and, and the uh, just have, as, have it be as nonlinear as possible. Um, because, again, we're getting ready to go into mission four, which is the train mission. And even though there is some there's some options there, again, you're it, you, you kind of feel like you're being herded in a way uh, yeah, a through, through, the, the through, through the through parts mission. of that. Yeah. So uh, we wanted the you know mission two and three to, to, again, just give as many as many options as possible uh, for accomplishing goals. And and uh, a lot of the vertical you uh, I was a big fan of this mission because my my favorite thief mission is uh, life of the party. And you know, a lot of people really enjoy that one just because because of the thieves highway and so uh i was real happy when, when we started play testing this to see uh echoes of that um in the mission here where you could get up on the roofs and, and really travel above the heads of, of the guard and look down on some of the conflicts and conversations and things uh it really yeah. started it really to me started feeling like thief uh in this mission when i was able to do that and i think the same is true for a lot of people yeah, we. Uh, I, I kind of wanted the uh, the city to exist on three vertical levels. There's the street level, there's the sewer level, and then there's the rooftops. And I wanted it to be very interconnected, but not really too interconnected. I wanted to force the player down to street level at different times. And the reason being is because if you if you stick too much to the underground or the thieves' highway, you uh, end up skipping a lot of gameplay and you end up bypassing uh, a lot of things that uh, I didn't want you to bypass. So um, there's there's a lot of vertical movement, but you're going back and forth a lot. And uh, I hope people were, were were okay with that. And the same thing is kind of true of the way that I used water in this map because it was possible for me to create like a canal system where there was like a big canal going through the whole map. But that's kind of what happened in, uh, in thief two and the ambush and courier missions. And, and I just kind of felt like that, that would lead to some boring scenarios because if you fall down in the canal, it's like the AI has a hard time following you. You can kind of hang out down there and there's nothing going on. It's just kind of plain. Um, but by keeping the waters kind of, the water kind of segregated to these pools, I could kind of encourage you to use ice arrows, but not really, uh, not really allow you to escape any of the gameplay. They're just kind of these isolated little sections here. Mm -hmm. And here you see like an example oh, yeah. of, of another uh, open exploration area where you can use an ice arrow to bypass uh, the water here to get some treasure. Right. Or not, if you don't want to. Or not, yeah, or not. <laughs> and, uh, and man, the hardest piece of loot, I won't give away where it is, but it's in this area. And, uh, <laughs> we might it, get it here. Yeah. It oh, are you going to go get it? it? It took me forever uh, to find this. And uh, But, you know, of course, again... To me, with with in Thief Two, the exception was masks and uh, casing the joint. But uh, I just felt like in in the Dark Project, it was really a challenge to get 100% of the loot. And uh, some of the not all the missions, but there's some of these where you know you really have to to look pretty hard. And uh, that was one of the spots right there where I just and never in a million years would have, <laughs> would have thought to uh, to find it there. But then again, I'm not a very skilled thief player, so. We got plenty of practice, but so no excuses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the other thing with this mission too is that um that I remember it was it was actually an easier one for the plot team because it was pretty straightforward. You know, there is there's no uh mandatory conversations, there's nothing that the uh that Zaya has to read. In other words, we don't have to uh, um lead her into a particular room to read a particular book. She's just gotta get to Kadar's shop. Yeah, and you don't need um, many choke points. Yeah, it, it was it was real, and I remember there there wasn't a lot of documentation for you as far as there wasn't a lot of uh, there were some readables in here, but not nearly what we had in uh, in mission two, uh, which I think was a good balance again because you did feel uh, again if you the way I play thief, uh, I feel compelled to stop and read every little thing along the way, mm -hmm. and uh, there was so much to read in the museum that it was kind of nice in this mission to not that wasn't required and and uh, we just we didn't leave a lot of books laying around we just pretty much stuck to the uh, the sneaking and the 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 rooftops and all that so so fictionally uh, one of the the most important things to communicate was really 
um, the lockdown in, in the market district, because I mentioned uh, in the Mission 2 commentary that where applicable, we wanted guards to be non-hostile. But uh, here, we didn't want to have a, a mission that was bereft of gameplay, so we needed hostile guards. So we came up with this fictional justification where the market district was on <laughs> lockdown um, due to the string of burglaries that are taking place uh, inside. And actually, in this map, one of the sub subplots that we have, one of the few subplots that we have, is the idea... <clears throat> that these thieves are, are in these shops breaking in, so you're not the only thief that's on the prowl. Right. And uh, very okay. close to this location, actually, you actually uh, witness two of the thieves uh, steal some goods and then get uh, jumped by the, right. the city watch. Or, for all we know, it could be Garrett that's been doing some of that, too. So. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> So uh, also, uh, speaking of non-hostile guards, we, we started out in the residential area, and we did want to communicate there that the player had kind of free reign to explore. So before the player breaks into the market district, um, they can kind of look around and, and uh, take in the sites and explore and, and not really have to worry about uh, a level of tension until they get to where the hostile guards are. And, and uh, we communicated that in, in you know a variety of different ways, as usual. We mentioned it in the briefing. It's mentioned in uh, your objectives. And then when Zaya actually breaks into the market district for the first time, uh, there's a voiceover again that clues you into the fact that the guards are going to be attacking you now. Right. Now, some of these signs, I don't know about in this, I think in this mission too, I know in some of the, um, in some of the missions, particularly mission one, uh, some of the signs for the shops, uh, there's very few of them that aren't a reference to some. Some people hate that, you know, but but mo most of them uh, are a reference to something, you know. I know for me, I, I did a lot of references to Discworld and uh, you mm -hmm. know some Terry Goodkind. I think even like Lord of the Rings, we were all pretty yeah. enamored with uh, Fellowship of the Ring at Conan the time. Conan the Barbarian, yeah, yeah, Conan the <laughs> Barbarian. And uh, but you know, I think one of the shops was called like Weta Bergen, you know, because we were all mm -hmm. watching the documentaries for, uh, for Lord, Lord of the, the Rings, Rings and obsessed time, yeah. with Weta and, and just how great all that was. So uh, and I don't know if you did that in this mission or not. I just uh, a little bit here and there. Some some of the store names I think you guys came up with, and then some of them I think were done right. by me. So yeah, it was but, a split. Yeah. And there's some that are uh, obviously pretty obscure. But I know anytime I know I can speak for Valletta and myself, we all pretty much always there was a reference to some fantasy literature or television show or a person or something like that. So yeah. uh, again, it pays to to kind of check out all those things uh, just to see if you yeah. recognize any any of them. Mm -hmm. um, So uh, one of the things I was going for here with the aesthetic, this, this is a, a pretty good example of, um, of the, the general aesthetic I was going for on the map, was, was kind of a, uh, a more upscale uh, Victorian market district. And you can mm -hmm. see kind of the, the Gothic architectural influences and the Victorian influences here. And I really wanted that to come through a little more strongly than it had uh, in the uh, original Thief missions and, and uh, also in, in the earlier uh, T2X mission, mission one, where it's more of a poor section. Mm -hmm. Um, w when we originally wrote the, uh, the plot document and the mission document for this map, um, the idea was to do um, partially like a market district and then partially like some warehouses. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more I started designing it, I kind of felt like the, the idea of warehouses was really played out in shipping and receiving, and it would mm -hmm. be a lot more interesting if we could go somewhere um, a little more upscale. Because Mission 1, when you first start um, an unexpected shelter, you're right in kind of a poor, uh, destitute area of the city. So it would be nice, you know, it's kind of a contrast to go somewhere that's, that's upscale. And when you steal from the merchants, you don't feel as bad because, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, corrupt. Uh, they're the corrupt, greedy merchants. And, uh, and obviously there's more loot for the taking here. Right. Well, and it also, again, kind of helped to establish um, you know where we were in the thief timeline because we didn't really see a lot of Victorian architecture in the dark project it was it was a lot of uh, uh, you know I don't want to say ghetto but you know it was it was just not most of the sections of town you were in were not very nice as opposed to you know even the beginning of thief 2 you start out with running interference you've got this nice uh, you know and posh Victorian posh, nice, right yeah. with all the white and blue textures and you know everything looks like ivory and uh, and then, you know, the same thing with the bank mission. And, you know, you've got several of those casing the joint all the, in, uh, in Thief 2. And, uh, you know, it kind of helps to translate. We're, we're not quite into that, uh, f you know, f full blown into, into the Thief 2 era yet, into the, into the Metal Age yet. But we're, we're getting there and you're seeing some of that, you know, again, reflected in the textures that are being used and uh, mm -hmm. some of the architecture and so on. Yeah, and we could pick which elements we wanted to emphasize and which ones we didn't. You know, we we always really like the the Gothic and Victorian stuff, so those are the kind of uh, influences that we wanted to bring to the project. Right. And a technical uh, aspect here, uh, since you're in this spot with all these lovely rounded uh, arches that I don't think had been seen before, really in uh, in fan missions, or that was something that, yeah. that was developed. 
Uh, did, I think Avalon came up with that. Or yeah, was it was actually you? Avalon. Okay. Avalon uh, actually came up with a way uh, using uh, Dramat's clunky BSP-based uh, editor to to make some really smooth arches. Yeah. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we showed those off in uh, in the museum map in here, especially. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of really super rounded arches. We're not limited to uh, to eight and ten sided cylinders anymore. We have right. you know sixteen or twenty sided curves, um, and that lends like a really unique aesthetic to the project. I think it makes a big difference in some areas. And I don't know if I, I you know I haven't played a lot of fan missions since. The so I don't know if that's something that's been adopted uh, very much at all. Not and, that I've seen, but maybe. But, uh, <laughs> hopefully it will be. But it, yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> I remember everybody was real excited about that, and I'm, I'm not. I was not the greatest at drama. At, I, you know, I was one of the writers and uh, uh, kind of coordinating things. But uh, you know, they were all so excited about this, and I, <laughs> for me, uh, I thought, okay, yeah, well, let, let's see what it does. A competition. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you, I remember you guys <laughs> were trying to like explain it to me, you uh -huh. know, and uh, that this will kind of give us an edge over some other things that are coming out mm -hmm. visually you know graphically it really yeah. it, it gives an updated look to the architecture and uh, i didn't understand it when you're explaining but of course when you see it if you're real mm -hmm. familiar with the architecture and thief when the, the first time you see one of those it's you kind of think wow that looks really nice and yeah, it so looks, looks a lot better than most of the stuff you see in the dark engine and it's kind of funny we're talking about this because obviously by the time t2x was released i mean you know we're even well beyond the smooth curves of quake 3 era i mean we were into <laughs> we were into stencil shadows by that point you know right. but uh you know you still you know for for thief players that are used to seeing like a in an aging dark engine i think it was a nice little touch that we were able to right. add Right. Yeah. So, any anybody that makes fan missions, if you're watching this, open up the editor and look at these, and you can see. How Actually, they, they they won't be able to. We oh, shipped, can they not? We, we shipped uh, stripped missions, so they oh, can't see the brush. That's <laughs> evil, man. That's we may, we evil. may release them at some point yeah. though, because if there's still interest, yeah. Surprisingly, people still are making Thief Two fan missions. So oh yeah, yeah maybe yeah. we should. New ones every day, yeah. and they seem to be getting. I mean, there's a lot of, of good quality stuff uh, coming out too. Yeah, and um, that, that's encouraging. I mean, it's de definitely <clears throat> encouraging for me. One of the one of the reasons that. Uh, I was personally was so desperate to get this project done and, and to see it through is because I, you know, I didn't want the thief universe to die. And I, I enjoy playing the fan missions and uh, I, we really felt like this, this whole project would just be a shot in the arm uh, for the community that had just lost, you know, we just lost our foundation kind mm -hmm. of, which was looking glass uh, and, and to really kind of send that message that look, we're, we're capable of, of doing this as a community and, and, uh, I uh, think putting we did. out some quality stuff here to play and we can still enjoy this this game you know? it, it's interesting though for a couple of years the community was kind of dead because I think all the uh, real experienced guys were sucked up by the different projects by us and by mm -hmm. uh, Circle of Stone and Shadow and right no fan Imperium. missions <laughs> yeah no fan guys. missions for a while yeah <laughs> right but uh, <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you know, man, this is this is the little rooftop cafe here that yeah. we're looking at. That was one of my favorite spots in this. It just uh again reminded me of life of the party so much. Um yeah, it's hard to get this vertical space in here and still allow the player to mantle up easily or, or use rope arrows to get up here. But uh, right. you know, there's a few spots where it seems to work pretty well. But you know, there was a sense, I think one of the things that, that so many people enjoyed about Life of the Party was, you know, there's something about being on a rooftop in the dead of night in the city that makes you feel like you own the place and you really feel like a thief. I mean, it, it really yeah. does lend credibility to this illusion, this fantasy that you are a thief prowling the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad that we got this in toward the beginning of the game because it, you know, it kind of lends that same uh, credibility to, to Zaya that she is capable of going out and kind of mastering the night and mastering the rooftops and uh, mm -hmm. that she's up to the task that is uh, that's before her mm -hmm. um, and this was good there's just a lot of variety of gameplay in here that, that you know is very reminiscent of uh, that one of the you know, that favorite mission from Thief 2 for yeah. so many people yeah that was a great map yeah it's interesting uh, um, talking about that because there were uh, a lot of different versions of this map um, it was actually uh, one of the first things I worked on in T2X. I, I was mission design lead, and I, and I wanted to delegate as much as possible, but I wanted to do at least one map. Mm -hmm. um, so I built an early draft of this, and, it was, and the original draft was actually um, bigger in terms of its street layout, but didn't have nearly as many places to explore and not nearly as many nooks and crannies. And uh, as I developed different versions of this and different drafts, the street layout kept getting simpler and simpler, but the, uh, the connectivity of the rooftops and, and the intricacy of spaces kept increasing until finally this is uh, the version that I think has the most little nooks and crannies to explore. Yeah. So if you don't want to tally, I mean, you can, uh, you can go pretty much straight forward on the street. Um, the, the layout of the city is, is basically like a big circle, so you're eventually bound to wind up at Kadar Shop. But if you want to explore and go to all these different places, then you, know, you, can, you can spend a really long time everywhere. I'm in the process process of um, uh, kind of editing some walkthroughs that have already been done by Nightwalker mm -hmm. and uh, 
um, adding to those loot maps. And man, this map is a bitch to, to try to uh, place all the loot in <laughs> yeah. on that map that we've got. Sorry. Trying to figure out, trying to figure out which direction <laughs> yeah. you're facing. What corner was that goblet in? You know, and you're mm-hmm. you're trying to make these maps, and it's like, oh gosh, it's just you can really get turned around in it. But again, that's uh, that's the personality of the city. You know that it, mm-hmm. it it folds back on itself, and the streets wind and twist, and all this. It just yeah. uh, and that's something that's what you, we love about it. Yeah, you see in in traditional uh, medieval cities and Victorian era cities is is uh, all these little alleyways and nooks and crannies mm-hmm. and places to go. It's it's mm-hmm. not something that uh, a lot of you know particularly Americans are familiar with, mm-hmm. having uh, these really tight narrow streets and different different places to explore. Well, it's the difference between a city that happen just happens in a city that grows you right know, it's exactly planned that it, it grows most, onto most, itself over time right yeah. most medieval cities are not planned and obviously the city falls that uh yeah. blueprint. you're gonna talk about the audio in this too because i this is this was uh i felt like also the mission where we were really trying to com- really communicated to to the player that uh we're trying to we're trying to step up to the plate here with the soundtrack and and com- and really yes. it was a very big plate with Eric Bush just doing the <laughs> right. sound uh, for right. for the thief games but right. uh yeah we, we definitely had a lot of sound ambitions in the very beginning we wanted a separate sound team um to do voices and ambience and uh music and and everything else that's associated with the thief game and uh we had um Originally, we had uh, an audio lead um, who didn't have really like the amount of time that was necessary to really dedicate to the project. He, he only really wanted to spend a couple hours on weekends, and uh, it, it, it was just too ambitious for that. So a- after uh, the first year, I think we, we really pretty much um, parted ways and uh, assembled a, a whole new team of audio guys, a, a smaller team actually, a more dedicated team. Um, at the end of the first year, we had, I think, 40 ambient tracks about five of which were useful because yeah, people, we people were making uh, audio tracks and they were like all different uh, compressions, like, you know, stereo instead of mono. They were radio shack wrong. microphones. Yeah, radio you know? shack <laughs> microphones. It was, just, it was just horrible. It, it was just, it, audio was like completely in crisis. And uh, we had two voices, both of which were done by Lone Star kind of on his own. And Lone Star wasn't there to help us because he actually uh, sold his audio equipment and left the community. So, so we were in a bad way for audio after the first year. Mm-hmm. Um, so we started over and we got uh, Paul Fox, who'd helped me out on uh, the Inverted Man's, um, he, he's an incredibly busy guy, but uh, always does great work. Um, really phenomenal sound guy. Who, who was able to help us out part of the time when he had time, and then a few other few other people like Keeper Crimson um, did a whole lot of audio, and a bunch of other guys did a, a number of tracks for us to really help us out. Well, and in a game like this, I mean, Thief, you know, kind of lives and dies by the sound. You know what I mean? Yeah. By the audio track because it is. Uh, it's it's just so much of the immersiveness, if that's a word, yeah. and um, uh, you know, from everything from the footsteps to the to the barks and just the different things, uh, but also just the, you know, even the wind whistling through uh, through the streets, and then of course in some of the pagan areas, you've got kind of the low hum of the. I don't know what whatever it is they use. You know, you hear oboes and all kinds of stuff in Eric's uh, soundtrack that he used string sections and all that, and uh, you really when you're trying to you know, again, we're trying to make something that was on par or at least did honor to looking glass. And man, you just, you've got to have crack audio. You know, you've yeah. really got to have a good audio track. And I, I remember that being a really scary point kind of when we realized, man, our, our audio is like two years behind uh, the rest of the project. And yeah. we, we've got to, we've got to make some changes here. And uh, <clears throat> fortunately yeah. these guys uh, came on board and really, uh, really came through for us. Yeah, fortunately we got some some really dedicated guys. Um, Crimson was really a uh, just a trooper. You mm-hmm. know, we, we had a lot of redos with him. He did like uh, you know he kind of liked to work. Um, you know, give us some stuff and then get feedback and then go back and make changes, which was great. Paul um, is just a consummate professional. And then we had some other guys like uh, you know Muzman and Manticore did some tracks for us, um, which were great. And uh, you know, eventually we had it. We brought everything together, but it, it's kind of funny though. The the most tracks that people did were were actually for undead maps. We had like four times the amount of undead <laughs> ambience than than like for anything else. We were always lacking for like wind and like basic like museum like or mansion backgrounds and stuff like that. We had to repeatedly go back and ask for them, but eventually we got it all. Everybody done. likes to make zombie noises. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, like the creepy, yeah. creepy undead stuff. Now, did you want to talk about the schemas here? <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess we could talk just technically for a minute, like about what the audio entailed for Thief, because um, 
uh, unlike unlike some other uh, more modern games, all the the properties um, for the sounds in Thief are actually controlled through text files um, called schemas. And in order to to define the properties of any given sound, um, you have to edit the schema. So you have to learn kind of a new tool set and how to edit these specialized text files. Um, and when I did the inverted mans, like uh, at the very beginning of, of T2X, kind of independently, I kind of experimented with that to kind of figure out what to do and uh, eventually ended up writing a tutorial on schemas and, and trying to figure them all out specifically so that they could be used in T2X and we could make good use of them. And uh, the, the nice thing about having separate uh, text files like that is that um, you can edit them independently at any given time and uh, you can control um, different aspects of the sound that you can't control with an individual wave file, for example. Um, you can control whether or not uh, a sound cue in the game can randomly choose between different wave files, or if you want to play a wave file um, consistently and repeatedly, or you want it to play and then pause and then play something else, or or you can adjust the volume or or anything like that. Like anything that you would typically associate with sounds is is all done through editing those text files. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a technical hurdle that we had to overcome. Um, one that was time consuming, not not real <laughs> challenging, but but definitely time consuming. Yeah. That was a lot. I mean, to me, there's just a lot of tedious uh, oh, yeah. things that you did. You know, when you first embark on this mission to create a campaign, you think about writing the story and creating these cool levels, and you you, you forget about you know having to have seven different uh, versions of somebody of, of an audio clip of somebody dying, and then trying to make all those sound like they were recorded in the same place, and you know yeah. all these little tedious things that you know oh, man. grammar and spell checking all the documents. I mean, there's just a lot. I mean, like you said with the schemas stuff that's not difficult necessarily but just takes a lot of time yeah, and a lot of time consuming and, yeah the, uh, the voice acting in particular was just a nightmare because uh, it, like i mentioned they, they, we only really had two of those voice tracks done and uh we can't just take the voice files and, and put them in game we needed to to write a schema for them and we needed to uh, to go through a post process uh so those sound files would ultimately uh sound consistent with uh, all the other voices in the game and and uh sound like we wanted them to sound um, so that is a really big, huge, tedious process. It's a thankless process. Unfortunately, we had at the very beginning a guy called uh, Muzman from the community who uh, who was really an experienced audio guy and had the most um, ha had the uh, most concise ideas about how to best go how to best go about that, how to right. best achieve like a sound for our voice files and get them sounding uh, high quality and, and comparable to the uh, original Thief and Thief Two voices. Yeah. And we had a couple um, of odd ones here and there that you know when you hear them you kind of go, oh wow, you know that could have yeah. been better. Well, th but, there's but again, an explanation for that, <laughs> and that is. Um, that that Muzman, I basically appointed Muzman to be the uh, the guy who who took care of that process because he was by far the most qualified and most knowledgeable, and I helped him out where I could. Um, but the problem was uh, it was so boring and tedious, and he he didn't have the time that he eventually he eventually left. He eventually disappeared, which uh, you know really frustrated the hell out of me at the time <laughs> because he was like the one guy who could control right. these voices. And so at the end, I ended up having to take over the slack. I basically took all the things that he taught me and and did the best job I could post processing the uh, the last of the files. But but ultimately, they're not going to be as good. And uh, some you don't really notice, like if somebody records at the start and is and is really clear and doesn't have a lot of noise then you know the the post processing job that I was able to do I think is comparable to the others but when you have like the problem voices that sound like they're recorded in a bucket like this <laughs> those I, I can't do much with so. yeah well and so it, 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 it got to that. a point you know we were like you say we we're so far behind there's the thief uh thing you're talking yeah. about where they oh yeah breaking. the thief guys breaking in yeah. again a nice little echo of uh life of the party where you where Garrett comes upon the house breakers you know that yeah. one part but um yeah, it, you know, we were so far behind on the audio at one point in particular, like like the voice acting. Um, it, it was an interesting thing trying to cast people because you would get these, uh, you would get kind of a demo from someone that their voice acting was great, but, you know, it sounded like they were standing in front of a, an airplane yeah, propeller or something while they were talking. I mean, it was just the quality of, of the recording was bad. The voice acting was great. Um, and vice versa. You get some really horrible voice actors maybe that yeah. uh, had really good, crisp, uh, clean audio files. So, mm -hmm. you know, trying to sift yeah. through all that. But we, we ended up actually... Um, uh, for variety's sake, but also for time, uh, a lot of the guys that built missions, I mean, I know I did some, I did three or four voices. I know you did mm -hmm. one or two. 
Mm-hmm. You know, guys that didn't sign up to do audio and didn't want to do audio yeah. had no no talent for voice acting whatsoever. Kind of had to step up and and uh, do some guards' voices and do some hammers and things like that. And I think you know we we got a lot of really good stuff. I still hear every time I, I go through and play this. Uh, like I, like I said, I've been playing through doing mm-hmm. some walkthroughs. And uh, there was a comment that one of the hammers made that I had never heard before. You know, yeah, there's tons. Uh, which that- to me speaks of the volume of stuff that we were able actually to, uh, in the end, uh, to come create. up with to create. Um, yeah, you know, part- that you can still hear new things every once in a while. Yeah, the problem really was was not so much that we were behind; it's just that we were just like so ambitious and uh, <laughs> we were so damn stubborn. Like we didn't want to scale back, <laughs> right? You know, so in any given voice, like the average uh, servant or noble probably has like eighty to a hundred voice files, right. and the average guard has like 150 to 170 um so those that's a lot of not only recording work but a lot of schema work and a hell of a lot of post-processing work. right so it was it was very much a pain to right. to get all those in the game but we but we did we ended up with uh, over 3,000 voice files i think right. probably closer to 3,500 when all was said and done yeah. which is uh just insane i, I don't think right. anybody else would do that for free if you know, <laughs> no matter what the you know no matter what the reward was yeah. i don't end. think i would do it again for free yeah but uh but it, de- you know, there there were some some times too when you know you you'd get uh, an audio file that uh, man, this this guy's really good. I wonder if he can, you know, he does a great guard voice. I wonder if he could also do a hammer, you know. And maybe he only signed up to do one or two things, and in the end, he ended mm-hmm. up doing eight or nine different, you know, maybe yeah. not that many, but doing a, a wider variety <laughs> than he expected at the beginning, and uh, you know, cha- being able to change his voice enough uh, to make him sound different, and and that was a, a real blessing too. Uh, to have some guys that were able to do that and girls that were able to do that. Yeah, I, I think that was. When when we found somebody that we liked who was both a good voice actor and who was able to record without too much noise, we tended to reuse them because it was such a hassle to find new people who, yeah. and communicate uh, exactly what they needed to do. Yeah, We um, had a special team that, uh, for guilt trips that we would, yeah. <laughs> we would assign. You need to get on this guy and, uh-huh. and really uh, lay it on thick and, and uh, see if you can get him to do some more stuff for us. It was interesting to hear all their personalities come through because in the beginning, um, when I took over audio and was giving direction to people, I actually did a a pretty bad job because I I assumed that people were kind of familiar with the thief voices and would know the kind of lines, (laughs) and uh, and people weren't. They they would come back to me and say like, "Well, what do you mean by grunt of pain?" And it's like, "Well, how do I type that out?" You know, like (laughs) in an email and describe what I need. But uh, eventually, you know, just uh, through very specific direction, I think, and a lot of back and forth, we ended up getting what we wanted for the voices Mm -hmm. and. uh, so hopefully you don't hear too many errors, if any at all. Yeah. And, you know, even within all those, um, you know, I hear things from time to time that, uh, you know, are kind of spoofs or takeoffs on lines from the original thing where, there, you mm-hmm. know, there's one, uh, uh, and I didn't even write it. It was a servant voice that I did. And I think Valletta or Toolhead actually wrote the lines for him, but where he's mm-hmm. Walking around talking about, uh, he says, "I don't know what everybody's complaining about. I like rat, you know, because yeah. uh, yeah, there had been some line in another one where a guy was saying something about eating rats. He yeah, wasn't eating rats. About rat complaining meat. about rat meat. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there's a lot of little <clears throat> things like that. But you know, you just you just have to catch be in the right place at the right time. And and uh, you know that that's nice for replayability that you kind of get some. Uh, it's not like a lot of fan missions where you just had two people doing the voices and it's kind of the same thing over and over. We really wanted to have that variety uh, again because yeah. that's one of the things that distinguishes uh, the the original games is that that uh, good the great voice acting the the, the wide variety of uh, you know of characters, characters yeah. some and, funny some serious you right. know it's it's really kind of an right. eclectic mix of, of right. characters. We didn't really have a standout like you know Benny in the in the originals. Yeah, but you, can't, you can't really copy Benny. You know. <laughs> yeah. I think we had a few people that were pretty funny. I, I think, yeah. uh, I don't know, one of my favorite voices, I think, is actually the one that Lazarus did for us, which was uh, one of the smuggler voices. Just, mm-hmm. he, he said he wanted, he went for, uh, what did he say, like Clint Eastwood with lung cancer or something <laughs> like that, like in order to get it right. Uh, well, I can't remember. There's one of the hammers that always cracks me up because, uh, you know, when he go, he'll he'll uh, give you that warning like you know where he, he he thinks maybe he saw you but he says uh he says oh it was it was nothing this speaks ill of my drink at the builder's <laughs> table you know and, and i thought that's just bro i mean that's something you would have heard in the original yeah. thief games and you know whoever i don't know if the the voice actor came up with that or one of our writers did but i just i thought man we're you know when when i start hearing things like that I, I when i was hearing things like that I, I thought you know we really we're getting close here you know we're we're really hitting mm-hmm. close to what to something i think looking glass would have been proud of 
Yeah, um, and, kind of and actually, the like, spirit. most of those lines, I think, were actually come up with by the actors themselves, because a mm-hmm. lot of times um, the writers weren't involved, like, hardly at all, because you guys were overworked, I think, doing doing other yeah. stuff in mission design documents. And, and I would write, like, a few example lines and sometimes specifics, and the conversation lines were specifics, but a lot mm-hmm. of the idle barks and so forth, I would kind of give them an idea and yeah, then we just didn't. let them riff on that. We didn't write those. And, right. uh, and some people did a really great job with it, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Pretty, some pretty funny stuff. I was, I was happy, you know, for it to, to have gotten to the point where it was. I mean, it was just <clears> neglected <throat> for a while, and then, uh, you know, for it to have yeah. come out the way it did, I was, I was real pleased. Yeah, um, and eventually we got some, some custom stuff at the end where uh, I think Paul Fox came in and did some creature voices for us and, mm-hmm. and some other stuff that, that really helped. Yeah. But here uh, we're approaching the end of the mission here. Right. And uh, this this building, we wanted Kadar's shop to be in a building with other shops, so it wasn't too prominent, um, so that it was kind of uh, secluded, kind of sequestered away, so it wouldn't be too obvious that it was abandoned. He just had kind of a room in this building. Right. And uh, we, we wanted basically only two entrances in. Um, there's two ways you can get in. You can find the locksmith on one side of the city and uh, steal a key to the front door, or if you go through the, uh, through the city in the other direction, you can go to the uh, Hammerite building and uh, make a lever that will open the, the portcullis on one side. Right. Well, and there, you know, there were also some questions, uh, you know, because obviously a year has passed. How is Kadar's stuff even still in this in this building? I mean, wouldn't mm-hmm. he wouldn't even have been evicted and his stuff thrown out in the street mm-hmm. at this point. Uh, but I think we do make a mention uh, earlier on uh, of him, you know, prepaying. Uh, rent, you know, paying rent forward or whatever to, to yeah, we had we had to kind of gloss over that. It was, yeah, it was a necessary kind of a tough, evil for plot, but tough thing. But, uh, yeah, we, we wanted to, uh, you know, but I think in the end, too, you know, it was trying to paint Kadar that plus the, the text that we actually find in his um, uh, in his uh, shop here, you know, kind of gives a little bit of character to him in that he was somebody that would have paid ahead, you know, eight, ten months or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't want to interact, have business with the smugglers. He was a fairly honest guy. <laughs> um had had the curator pegged from the beginning that he was a little bit of a weirdo, you know, mm-hmm. um, and so I, I didn't mind too much that uh, the idea of him prepaying that far in advance. But yeah, and so uh, here's a shop, and you know, just kind of trying to reveal a little bit at a time along the way of what happened and how how we came to the point that we were in the first mission where he was ambushed by these guys. Mm-hmm. And this is a pretty small shop. We just wanted to give uh, the player the opportunity to to steal a couple pieces of loot and and uh, not have to look too hard to really find uh, the one critical piece of information, which was the uh, the uh, papyrus that you find in the hidden compartment underneath the counter. Mm-hmm. Right there. Mm-hmm. You said Avalon actually paid you a rare compliment on this one. The man who yeah, never he actually did. <laughs> there was several drafts of this and. Uh, um, one of the biggest things I changed from from draft to draft was uh, cutting back the uh, the uh, residential district in the very beginning because I, I thought that was kind of a um, kind of a pointless space you know I mean it, it's good it's good to have it there for uh, for exploration purposes and kind of set the mood but but really um, we wanted to get into the the market district as soon as possible and I wanted to expand. Uh, uh, the rooftop gameplay and, and whatnot. And uh, there were a couple versions. Uh, there, there were two versions that were just radically different from each other. And when I uploaded the new one, Avalon, Avalon seemed to like it. And I, I knew that I had kind of a winner at that point because he never, <laughs> he never, never, never paid anything. Yeah, never liked anything. So uh, out of all the missions I built, I think uh, professionally and, and uh, um, on a fan mission level, I think this is one of my favorites, if not my most favorite, just because uh, this was probably the most labor of love, I think, and required the most time out of all of them. Yeah. So yeah, it was a fun one. Mm. Oh, the sewer so, map. Uh, I guess I guess we should say we were talking about the uh, the aesthetic of the map uh, a little bit earlier. A lot of that is also owed to the uh, texture artist that that uh, helped me out on this level. Um, we actually started construction of this map. Uh, before we had any art resources, that was one of the advantages of, of building a thief city is that I kind of felt like the thief aesthetic was established. But, you know, at the end when we got uh, a dink to come in and I think John P helped out a little bit too and made some custom stucco and, and some custom brick and we got all that in, uh, I think things really started to come together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So combine those combined with the, uh, the new Victorian look and kind of the smooth arches and, uh, the kind of rich lighting scheme down here, I think, I think is what sold the map aesthetically. 
So I'm still kind of happy with it on that front. And again, too. you feel very familiar because <clears throat> you know one of the first places we go in the Dart Project is down in the sewers beneath uh, Bafford's yeah, Manor, so. and so here we are again. You know, yeah, it's a good place to end sewers. up. Yeah.